I'm Amanda. And I'm Mike. And this, this is Saturday, Saturday Morning Serial. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Saturday Morning Serial. I'm Amanda, here with Mike, and today we are talking about a really exciting film that, Mike, you have been waiting for for a long time. And that is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And boy, was this movie full of, I don't know, it was full of ants. It was full of ooze. It was full of weird things. It was very bizarre and fun. It was strange, right? I agree. And I didn't hate it. I, I mean, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I know right now there's a lot of mixed reviews going around about this film. A lot of them are arguing that it's more of a Kang movie than it is an Ant-Man movie, um, which we'll dive into that a little bit here in a second. Um, but yeah, Mike, what was your overall, like, what did you think overall of the movie? I mean, you're seeing it again tomorrow. <laughs> I, I'm going to direct my folks to see it. My boomer parents, we're going to go see this movie together. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always, now that Captain America is gone... Ant-Man is my favorite MCU character, and he's just he's just so fun, and his powers are so unique, and having him in this movie and getting that exploration movie out of the quantum realm that I've wanted since the first Ant-Man movie, I want to see what it's like down there, and, and what goes on down there, and who's down there, as we find out, like, mm-hmm. this is the movie I've been waiting for, I would I would like to see more ants, though. Yeah. More more ants. I mean, you said that with the first two movies, like, we appreciate the humor. Like, I love the Ant-Man movies because of the humor. And one character that I really missed was Louise in this movie, um, just because we love his monologues. Um, but, my, you, Mike, you did say that, like, this movie was, yeah, the Ant-Man movie you've been waiting for. You've wanted to see Ant-Man travel through the different realms and all that stuff. So... I mean, I miss Luis too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, his 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 monologue in the, his flashback and his storytelling in the first Ant Man movie is just it's just one of the best scenes in the MCU, period. And it's just so fun and it was so it was shot really well. And then Luis just makes everything funny. Like I miss the X Cons in this movie, but I can understand like why they needed to get to the quantum realm when they did and mm-hmm. tell that story. Right. And I really, I liked how we were in the quantum realm more in this movie than any other movie that we've seen in the Marvel Universe. So Mike, tell me about the cast. We all know that you love the man himself. (laughs) So we have, this movie of course was directed by Peyton Reed, who filmed this movie on the volume. And if you've been watching The Mandalorian, you know that that's how they film all those cool scenes on The Mandalorian is they film it with the volume, which is that big 360 LCD studio that they project backgrounds onto so that uh, characters who wear metallic clothing or armor or weapons that the environments that are CGI later later in the movie are reflected on them. So Peyton Reed has directed some of those uh, Mandalorian episodes. He directed the one with the ice fighters, and he, of course, directed some of the best Star Wars ever with Luke's comeback in The Mandalorian Season 2. So, we have Peyton Reed returning to direct, of course. We have Paul Rudd as Scott Lang, Ant-Man. Evangeline Lilly, I said that correctly now, I'm ha- proud of myself, as Hope Van Dyne. Jonathan Majors is here as King. Catherine Newton as Cassie Lang. David Dastamit. Challen as Veb. He is a returning actor from the previous two movies. He he uh, played one of the ex-cons. We have Kath, Katie O'Brien as Gentora, a rebel leader. And we have William Jackson Harper as Quaz, the guy who can read minds. Bill Murray is Lord Krylar. Michelle Pfeiffer returns as Janet Van Dyne. And Corey Stahl comes back as Modoc. You might remember him as uh, Darren Cross from the first Ant-Man movie. And, of course, we have the man, the legend himself, Michael Douglas, as Hank Pym. I love him. <laughs> and right now, too, you can just tell, like, 
our dads are both retired, and I just get, like, such, like, a retired vibe from him, even though he's not really retired, <laughs> but he's lived his life, and his, you know, child and his adoptive grandchild, now Cassie, is in the family business, and he just, he wants to be with his aunts now, right? <laughs> So, Mike, we left off on a cliffhanger on the last episode, if you recall. So, tell the audience what your relationship is with Ant-Man and Paul Rudd. Um, so, we had the pleasure of meeting Paul Rudd at C2E2 a couple years ago. And I got to dress up as his Baskin-Robbins character mm-hmm. and uh, get a photo with him. And then he signed uh, a Funko Pop of mine and he signed my uh, Civil War poster. So, um, but before all that, I was in the hospital and I was having an operation done and I was under heavy sedation and I was very anxious about the operation and what it meant for my future. But, uh, Amanda was there to reassure me, not about feeling better, but that some, a certain guest was coming to C2E2 and that we would meet him. So what, what happened in that moment when I woke up and you, you told me this news, Amanda? I told, I was like, Mike, like, I, I, first off, I was, obviously, I was like, Mike, are you okay? And you're like, yeah. And I'm like, guess what? Paul Rudd's coming to see 2 e 2 And I kid you not, I did not expect the kind of joyous reaction that you showed. And you were under heavy anesthesia. So, you know, you were just like, oh my God, really? Like, oh, we have to go now. Oh my God, I have to meet him. And, you know, you were just going on and on. And then... You know, just on and on about like, oh, Spider-Man's my favorite, but no, I think Ant-Man's my favorite. But you know what? No, Ant-Man's my favorite Avenger. And Spider, like you were just going back and forth. Um, and then you were quiet for like I don't know a minute or two, and then all of a sudden you just like sigh out. You're just like, I love Paul Rudd, and you're like, you know, anesthesia haze you were under. <laughs> I th- I think. I love Paul Rudd is what I said when you told me that you loved me. I think I said, I love Paul Rudd. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. I mean, I know how I rate over Paul Rudd, and I mean, I'm not mad. <laughs> and, uh, well, when we got to C2E2 to meet Paul Rudd, um, oh C2E2 is, uh, um, it's very hard to get parking. So we booked a parking garage, like, down the street you know, with whatever app we were using, and the guy sold our spot. So we we show up to get to this convention, and our parking spot's gone. Because the Shamrock Shuffle package pickup was the same day, time, and place as C2E2. At the McCormick Center, yeah. Whoever scheduled that, shame on you. Yes. So we were without a parking spot and like our opportunity to meet Paul Rudd for the autograph was fast approaching. And Amanda's like, you know what? Go meet Paul Rudd. I'm going to park the car. So I left and I ran from whatever, wherever we were into the convention center. And I got to meet Paul Rudd and get his autograph. And this whole time, Amanda's in her, her Jesse cosplay, trying to park the car and she can't, she, there's just no getting into this garage. So she had to turn around and park wh- where, Michigan was, Avenue. What happened was you got out and I, you, you probably ran like two blocks. And for blocks, that's big in Chicago here. And I was just sitting in standstill traffic. There was absolutely no escaping it, but just sit there. And I'm dressed as Jessie the Cowgirl from Toy Story. And I am sobbing. Like, I have, like, angry tears spilling down my cheeks because I just, like, I was done. I'm like, I'm never going to know. This is done. So, you know, finally, after maybe, like, an hour or two, they opened up another lot and they started directing cars there. And I was in that line. And it was almost like as soon as I got up there, that lot got filled and it closed. And I said, you know what? Screw it. And I just like drove so fast in anger down Lakeshore Drive. And I just parked in the loop, (laughs) which is um, in the Millennium Park garage. So, you know, it's like dead set in the middle of the loop. And I just like ripped my cosplay off in anger. I'm like, just screw this whole entire convention. I hail a taxi and the taxi cab's like, how's your day? And I was like, "Ah." (laughs) and then I get to the convention center and Mike, you're just like, 
what happened to you? And I'm like, don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Don't even. And then we get in line for the Paul Rudd um, photo op, which by miraculous, like, godsend, whatever, I made it. And he, like, rubbed my shoulder in, like, a comforting way, almost like he knew I was, I had, like, the most shittiest day. Like, and then after the photo op, I was like, oh, he was so nice. And then you and this guy that went before us, they, you guys were like, did you see how smooth his skin was? And you, Mike, you were like, oh, his hand was so smooth. He and was gleaming. Me he and was this, glowing. Me and this girl just looked at each other and shrugged because we're like, we lost our boyfriends to Paul Rudd, in conclusion. <laughs> The man wakes up every day and chooses happiness. <laughs> I, I admire it. Yeah, I mean, he's he's so, yeah, he looks like, too, he'd be just so fun to hang out with. So with that, it's been, what, quite a while since we have seen um, Paul Rudd on the big screen in Ant-Man. So, Mike, what did you expect going into this movie? Uh, well, I heard a lot of earlier views that described it as a Rick and Morty episode, which really excited me because I knew it was going to be bizarre. I knew it was going to be fun. I knew it was going to be appealing to my physics to education so yeah i expected this fun movie with uh exploration and i expected this this great villain and i expected uh Barbara and the cast to just uh win me away on this this fun adventure and they did i feel like all my expectations were met i, I had a great time with this movie yeah i was really hoping to see you know Loki and Sylvie because they were rumored to be in this movie but that's just my fangirl mind being all ah, you know but I really didn't think much of this movie uh you know because Marvel is just it's so different than how they were in the like Thanos era so anything's possible especially with the multiverse right now so I just went with it and I was really excited to see Kang after seeing him in Loki and I was excited to see how menacing he was going to be in this movie compared to the loosey-goosey fun um, He Who Re Who Remains in Loki. So um, I was excited for Kang mostly. So did this feel like an Ant-Man movie to you, Mike? Or was it starkly different from your taste? Well, Ant-Man movies uh, historically have always been about heists. And I love a great mm -hmm. heist movie. Um so this one was more Star Wars oriented. It was like, okay, we're at this new planet. We got to go to this bar. We're going to meet new people, new aliens. There's this big evil guy here who, who's kidnapped my daughter and he can move things with his mind and he can choke people mm -hmm. and he wants, uh, he wants something from me in return. So yeah, it's, it's different, but that's what these Marvel movies do is they're not interested in telling the same story over and over again. Like, how different is Thor 3 from Thor 1? And how different is, mm -hmm. you know, Captain America 3 Civil War different from the first Avenger? Like, these movies, they they grow with the character. The characters have, a, have an arc and the movies grow and become different. Yeah, I definitely felt like it was an Ant-Man movie um, because there were the jokes and Paul Rudd was there and... Um, I really, I do like Wasp as well. I think um, they're just, they're this big power couple. So I really like how she just kind of adopted Cassie. I, I thought that was just really sweet. Um, so I really like the family dynamic that they have formed in this movie. Um, you know, just with Kang though being like this big bad, you know, it, it kind of took me out of it being an Ant-Man movie, but yet it, it, it still did feel like an Ant-Man movie, if that makes sense. You know, it's funny you think about that, because if you think about, like, if aliens were to just appear on the ground r right now in, like, the Marvel Universe, like, who are they going to run into first? Are they going to run into the bigger characters, or are they just going to run into, like, a smaller, like, street-level character like Ant-Man? And this was the movie that took Ant-Man from, like, a street-level character and transformed him into, like, uh top a great avenger like mm -hmm. like iron man or doctor strange or cap yeah right and so this movie is two hours long which is pretty short compared to like the recent marvel entries i mean spider-man was freaking what three and a half hours <laughs> so do you believe it made the most of its runtime yeah it was uh it got going pretty quick i mean the first act uh is just you know basically you know a narration and then a little bit taste of like where the characters are and then it just 
gets into the quantum realm. So Yeah, they really didn't waste any time with the quantum realm, like, getting into it. Yeah, uh, they hopped right into it, and, uh, of course, it uses this two-hour runtime and develops Kang really well. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, it also develops Janet Van Dyne yes. really well, which she was an incredible character in this movie, just knowing what she had been through and the relationships she, she had in the quantum realm and who she stood up to. Like, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't believe how, like, she's she just put her foot down and said, you know what, this guy's my friend and I, I care for him, but what he's capable of, I can't allow. And if it's going to leave me here stranded for the rest of my life, then I have to do it. Mm-hmm. So, talking about the characters, do you think the movie balanced all of them out pretty good? I mean, Hank Pym really didn't get a lot to do. No, he didn't. And, um... But he did save the day. He did save the day. He did have that deus ex machina moment with his quantum futuristic ants. Yep. Um, and then, of course, Wasp, the, orig- the new Wasp, uh, Hope, was really underutilized. Like, yeah. I would like to see her used some more, but... And, you know, if we had gotten an extra, like, I don't know, 20 minutes in this movie and we had we had Hope do some more stuff, that would have been cool. I didn't really like Cassie. Um, I just, I don't know. It, it just something didn't feel right about the character just um, all of a sudden being this genius about the quantum realm. And, um, I mean, it's sweet how she wants to follow her dad's footsteps and... You know, she really looks up to Hope and and Hank and Janet. Um, and they're like her adopted family, like I said. But I, I don't know. It, and I don't know if it was the actress's portrayal of Cassie. I just, I don't know. I just wasn't a big fan. I can't put my finger on it yet. Why? Um, but I really did like how we learned more about Janet. I like her relationship with Kang um, because it kind of gave him a personable side. And, and it set up what he's capable of, who he is, um, where he came from. So that was good. Um, but yeah, I agree. Hank really didn't have a lot of screen time. And I was just weirded out by Bill Murray's character. I don't, I feel like maybe he really wasn't needed, but I don't know. That was just me. (laughs) Yeah, he really wasn't needed. I mean, but it was Bill Murray. So they, they had to write him in. I'm sure he had been working with Paul on Ghostbusters and, yeah. They became best of buds. That's true. Um, I really did enjoy the new characters, too. I liked the Ooze Man, and I liked, um, like, the warrior lady and um, the guy. Like, I just liked, like, that whole, I don't even know what they were called, but the... The, 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 the rebels. The rebels, yeah. The yeah. people that lived in that Quantum Realm area. Um, they were like a, a what was that called? Like, rebellion to King. Um, right? Like a rebellion type of thing. Yeah, they yeah. they were uh, col- colonialized, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, and then King took over and all hell broke loose. So, of course, they want to get back at King. So, are there characters or plot points that you would have liked to see more of, Mike? Yeah, getting back to more Hank. And then, of course, like, you know, everything we needed for that relationship with Janet and King was there. But I would like to see more. And, of course, you know, um, Cassie Lang. Like, I, she didn't work for me as much You know, I'm sitting either. here thinking about that, and I think it was just, like, the time jump. Maybe that's why we really were disconnected with Cassie. You know, I think it was the recast. That I too, think, yeah. I think one of the most emotional moments in Endgame is, is when uh, Scott Lang goes back to his house, and he discovers that Cassie's alive and that she's, you know, five years older. And we, as an audience, made an emotional connection with with that portrayal of Cassie. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the moments they cut back to at the end of Endgame. And, you know, it's how they, how they wrap up the movie. And, yeah. you know, that's the cool thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that when a character is cast, even if they're a small role and they turn into a big role, they're still the same actor. Mm-hmm. And for them to just go, you know what, we want Catherine Newton for this role because she's a bigger ki- she's a bigger star, you know. I didn't really feel it. Yeah, same. I agree with all that. How does King rank as a villain for you? Oh, man. I mean, there's so many great Marvel villains, which is a, a, word, a sentence I never thought I'd get to say because, you know, back in Phase 1 and 2, we really didn't get a lot of great villains. I mean, 
Now we have Loki, we have Kang, we have Fisk, we have uh, Mysterio, we have all of the rainy Spider-Man villains. We have, you know, everything com uh, coming together. But Kang, this portrayal by Jonathan Majors is incredible. He is frightening in every scene that he's in. He is just a smoke. He's a loaded gun. He is a loaded gun in every scene. You do not know what he is capable of. You do not know what he is thinking. You do not know how far ahead he is of you, and you do not you do not know who who he's going to hurt or what what he's going to do. It's it's terrifying. I was terrified of King. And he's really jacked as hell. He I know. Plus he's so much. He's so out of Ant Man's league. Yeah. Like. Like, he is, like, a cosmic-level character. Well, and it doesn't help that they play the Creed trailer before this movie, and you just see Jonathan Majors is, like, just booming muscles, and then a sleeve gets ripped off him while he's king, like Ant-Man and him have a fight, and you just see his big biceps. I'm like, man, this guy is, yeah. Nice-looking villain, too. Thanos, he was not nice-looking, so it, it's nice. He's a nice-looking, menacing villain. <laughs> But I agree. I love Kang. And I like I like how he's like, he, there's people out there that when they get mad, they scream and yell and whatever. Kang is a very quiet, patient villain. And it's that silence that he gives that is just so jarring. And that's why I love him. Like, I mean, Thanos is great, but Kang, he's just like another level of villain. And this is going to be exciting to see even more of him. Especially in Loki. He reminded me a lot of, like, a Darth Vader portrayal. Like, yeah. Just, just you know, when he enters the room, the whole the whole mood of the scene changes. And then there was a... The first end credit scene had a bunch of kings in there. So, Mike, what do you think that all means? We had, like, Pharaoh King and, I don't know, the other one that was, like, dark and tall and looming. <laughs> Yeah, we've got we've got this Where's Waldo assortment of kings everywhere, and I what I hope it means is that King will show up in other movies as a villain. Um, maybe he'll show up in Fantastic Four, or maybe he'll show up in you know other uh, other smaller movies, and each character will kind of have their own interaction and their own kind of variant of King that they fight, and then yeah. When the Avengers get together, they go, "Oh, hey, I fought, I fought this King guy. Who did you fight?" And they go, "Oh, I fought King." And then they, you know, Paul Rudd can come in and be like, "Oh, he's coming. All of them are coming. It's it's going to be ridiculous." So yeah, that's why I want to see. You have a theory that even though like Judge Run Slayer is um, his love interest, right, in the comics, but you said it could be interesting if she was a King. Yeah, she could be a female variant of King. That would be cool. Yeah. All right, Mike. So give me some positives of this movie. Um, Paul Rudd, Evangeline hmm. Lilly, the cast, and everyone was cast really well. The visuals were great. Uh, Jonathan Majors as Kang, incredible. Uh, I love all, I, I like the humor in this movie. I like, I don't know why, but as soon as we left that theater, we were chanting, drink the ooze, yes, drink, drink the, the ooze. ooze. <laughs> and the uh, holes joke. <laughs> The holes joke, yes. It's so stupid, but how yet many, it's funny. Did you, when they were like, how many holes did you have? Did you stop? And were you counting on your fingers like I was? <laughs> no. I was just really confused. I'm like, why is this relevant to anything? Yeah. No, I agree with all that. Um, and it was just, it was a good story, and it was a good introduction to King in the MCU. It gave us some good backstory. So now going forward... When we do see King, we don't need any more of that backstory. We got it. So what do you think some negatives are? Oh, I was just going to uh, touch on one more positive. Oh, yeah, go for it. What about that probability storm? Is that not cool? Like when he was down there getting the core of the ship and then he had just, you know, oh. every single possibility of what he could have done had just yes. manifested. I don't know about you, but I'm a very indecisive person. So to, for that to happen, it would it would be the death of me. Like that seems like a great visual of like what anxiety is. Yeah. It's like I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do that, I could do that, and then you get to see like which ones prevail, which ones fail, and then it's the voice. It kind of goes back to the first Ant Man movie where Scott Lang is in the quantum realm and he hears his daughter's voice. And he's void, and he's in that void between space and time, and he's just shrinking, and he hears Cassie's voice, and that's what—that's 
what gets him to kind of uh, get out of the quantum realm. Mm-hmm. And here it's it's Cass. It's when all the Ant Mans hear Cassie's voice that they that they unify and they r- have that common goal to get the core ship. And then there's that one uh, Baskin Robbins one. <laughs> the one Baskin Robbins. I don't know You're why doing he was great, there. great, buddy. <laughs> I'm sure it was just a gag. Don't think too hard about it. Like, no. where did he get that costume from? Like, yeah. yeah, no, that part was great, and how Hope like kind of was the one to dig him out of all that. I thought that was nice. Again, I liked how they developed their relationship, but also them as a family. So, yeah. But anyway, yeah, I love that part. That okay. part was so funny. Now we're gonna talk about the negatives. Yes. So we both agree that. Uh, although I appreciate Catherine Newton as an actress, and I've seen her in Freaky, and I like her in Detective Pikachu, uh, you know, she just doesn't have that place yet in my uh, love for this franchise as Cassie Lang. Um, and Modoc, we gotta talk yeah. about Modoc. I was not a fan of this guy. No. Uh, he was okay, and then he took off his mask, and then he was just this like Gerber baby machine. Ugh. And I didn't really care for that because I, I yeah, yeah. Um, and him and his whole arc and how he how he comes to his heroic moment and how he dies it, it doesn't work for me. I would have been fine with him being excluded from this movie and more time being spent on Hope or Janet. Yeah, I did not like that. I was so uncomfortable every time he came on screen. I yeah. I just and you're right. It could have worked a little bit better if he left the mask on, but yeah, because his mask when it kind of when it's Corey Stoll's big ass face, like in, in your face, no. Yeah, I mean, if it would have been cool if he was still like the yellow jacket, like if he was yeah. just like a reformed yellow jacket, and he was in that same costume and it was the same character, that might have been cool. For me, it was a joke that just kept on going, and you it, wish it would have stopped. Like two seconds after it, it was started. like it was like the screaming goats in four. You're yeah. Like, okay, we know this we, is awkward. Can we move on? Yeah, exactly. And just how they gave him like this whole thing of like an arc and then a heroic death. I'm just like, why? This is so dumb. You know, I, I, I yeah, I did not like that character at all. I thought it was stupid. <laughs> So where do you think, oh, we already talked about where do you think Kang will show up next? Obviously Loki, season two. Um, and then you said Fantastic Four. I can't wait for the new Avengers movie when they all might, we don't know for sure, but, you know, it's the Kang, universe, or Kang Dynasty, right? Is that what they're calling it? So the first one is called the Kang Dynasty, and yeah. then the second Avengers film is called uh, Secret Wars, so which I'm, so I'm familiar excited. with. Uh, from this 90s Spider-Man and it's serious being a thing. A lot of people think that the king of this movie, when he dies, he doesn't die. He he He's in, uh, engulfed by his ship and he inherits the ship's powers and he's going to become the Beyonder. Hmm. And the Beyonder in the 90s and in Spider-Man show grabbed a bunch of heroes and a bunch of villains and he, he he couldn't decide which was the stronger force in the universe so he took spider-man he took he took spider-man and he took the fantastic four no i think he just grabbed spider-man he, he put spider-man on this planet he's like spider-man you're gonna pick out some forces of good to help you and spider-man assembled all the other different franchises from the saturday morning um cartoons at the time and then Dr. Octopus was there, and uh, the Green Goblin, and all the other villains from the shows were on there, and it was kind of just like this big chessboard battle. So, hmm. maybe that'll happen. That'll yeah. be cool. Uh, just just an excuse to go into different franchises and pluck out what worked and what didn't work, and throw it all on a board, and be like, okay, this is what we're playing with, this, this movie. And these actors are just all so great, because they'll come back. They love working on these movies and their characters. So I, I no matter t- how old they are. Yeah, I know Toby. Toby was just waiting for the phone. He's probably just waiting for the phone to ring, and then <laughs> yeah. Um, Hugh Jackman's probably just like, I just want, I just want a, a, a good story. Right. Um, but you haven't seen X Men, so yeah, I you haven't. know. That, I, I have seen the one Wolverine movie though. You saw the one Wolverine movie, and you saw both Deadpool. So we'll yeah. see if these outer franchise characters come back in but right. if they don't like if it's just the new avengers it'll be enough for me yeah 
So originally the movie ended with Hope and Scott trapped in the quantum realm at the cost of defeating Kang. Would you have liked this original ending more than what was in the movie? Uh, I mean, it was kind of... A, they both... They were both okay endings, in my opinion. Like, if Scott had been, like, wounded and his, he was on his deathbed and he defeated King and then he was trapped in the quantum realm, that's just the ending of the last Ant-Man movie mm-hmm. again. Um, and then this movie, we got to see... You know, all those characters were standing on the other side of that portal, and they were waiting for Scott to come back, and then no one, no one jumped through, and then finally, uh, Jan, uh, uh, Hope, Hope jumps through, and then they're a team again, and they start kicking King's ass. I was like, go for it. Oh my God, though, him, King beating Ant Man up to a pulp. Oh my God, that was so stressful. He was kicking his ass. Yeah, it was like. It was like, what is this? Uh, you were cringing hard. Brawl. It was like a bare knuckle brawl in like yeah. an Ant Man movie. Like, what is this doing here? Right. right. It was, I was so worried for him. I'm glad it ended the way it did because y- we already had people trapped in the quantum realm and have an uncertain future. So just to have a nice family wrap up at the end was good. But I loved how the movie kind of started back to where him like walking down the street all like you know some say my life is you know and then he goes into this panic like what if we actually didn't defeat king what if and just going over the what ifs and then he goes nah no we we beat him we're good everything's good i like that i think that was good because that really foreshadowed the future I mean, what if Scott Lang is the one who saves the universe in Avengers Endgame and then in this next upcoming Avengers movie is because he has no drive to warn the other characters about Kang and he leads to, like, the downfall of the universe? Yeah. How how twisted would that be? That'd be crazy. Yeah, for someone as positive and fun as Ant-Man to have this, like, detrimental mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be on, like, this... Uh, uh, like a level of mistake up there with like Sylvie. Yes, definitely. So, do you want an Ant Man four? Uh, I think, I think I I I don't. Hmm. I um, I don't know what else to do with these characters. I mean, they've already had their their two heist movies. They've had um a quantum mini a, a quantum realm exploration movie. Um, it would have to be really interesting to see where they would go with it and what they would do because like you know a lot of, most of this movie worked but a lot of it didn't and the the parts that didn't work are not going to be the parts that didn't work are going to be the ones that continue on like like cassie and mm-hmm. all that stuff so i mean I'm kind of, I could go either way. I mean, if this is the last Ant-Man movie, okay. But if they give, if they give us another one, like, you know, let's get back to the gang, the ex-cons. Let's, let's explore, uh, Janet and Hope more and with, with Hank. And, uh, let's, let's see what Cassie does. Yeah. I, you know, they wrapped it up so good. And going back to the ending, if they left Hope and, scott in the quantum realm then yeah i would say definitely a fourth movie is a coming and b needed but they wrapped it up so well with the van dyne family that i think that could be it now that's not saying that scott will appear in further marvel films you know i could definitely see him popping up in like a psa or something like you know captain america did in (laughs) spider-man So, are you suffering from anxiety? I'm Scott Lang. And, I'm yeah. here to help. <laughs> yeah. I once thought I'd doom the world to all an eternal damnation, but I'm okay and I can help you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the movie ended and we sat through the credit scene. And boy, am I glad we did because I saw my man Loki in the second post credit scene. And it was King, and I think it was the St. Louis, um, the World Fair in the 1900s. Um, And so we see Loki and Mobius, they're in the crowd, and what looks like an inventor, and it's King on the stage, and Loki is so scared. Um, Yeah, I mean, 
when Loki was scoring up with Thanos in Infinity War, he didn't really seem scared. He kind of knew that Thanos was a big guy, but he wasn't scared of Kang. Loki in this, I, when we left, I was like... He wasn't scared of Thanos. Yeah, he wasn't scared of Thanos. Yeah. Loki is terrified of Kang. Like, yeah. like unreal that the event, the, the villain from the first Avengers movie is now just like a puppy dog in the face of Kang. Yeah. And that I think that's too what makes Kang so menacing is going into Ant-Man knowing how afraid Loki is of Kang. And he just knows that he who remains Kang right now. The Lucy Goosey Fun King, but even he was unnerving to Loki. So yeah, and yeah, just seeing Tom again as Loki, I'm so excited for the summer. Yeah, are you excited for Loki season two? I'm waiting for that trailer to drop. I'm waiting for some information. What what's gonna happen? <laughs> you know, I've they? I've learned not to trust Twitter anymore from these um quote unquote sources saying, oh, a trailer is gonna drop Monday. Well, guess what? It's uh, what's today? Friday. Nothing. Um, Nothing. You know, who knows? Maybe the maybe it'll come out in August and yeah. But we'll see. But you know, I'm excited. <laughs> All right, and with that, we're gonna end it here. What did you guys think of Ant Man? Let us know because there's a lot of mixed opinions on this movie. So we know people that didn't like it, and we know people that absolutely love it. Mike, you're one of the people that love it. So yeah, I would say, yeah, I'm leaning more towards the love for this movie. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we would definitely like to hear what you thought. And stay tuned for our next episode. You don't want to miss out. And we'll talk to you next time.